So when I think of what a transformed family law system looking like, uh, for me, it's quite clearly one where we're um, having more space for recognition of Indigenous law, certainly in the area of child welfare. There's no doubt that that's the direction things have to move in. In general, for family law, um, I, I think a transformed space may very well um, I think the direction we're moving in is recognition of Indigenous laws and how we deal with family law issues in the longer term. But in the immediate term, I think we need to also make space for how to do that practically while things are moving at a different level. So how do we involve Indigenous communities in making family law decisions? How do we truly honor uh, a child's rights. So we talk a lot about the voice of the child and the rights of the child, but our whole family law process, our whole child welfare process, in fact, is not built on the rights of children. It's just not. It's not built to listen to children. Um, so I think what it looks like is to acknowledge that Indigenous children have a right to be continually connected to their culture. So how do we make um, decisions um, upon divorce or separation, how do we make decisions which recognizes that the child has an individual right to maintain those cultural connections? Um, and how do we make sure that that happens in practice? Um, when I look, when I think of the family law process now, the child welfare process now, so all of the laws basically that we have dealing with children, right now they're based on exclusion very much. Um, it's sort of like children and families enter this system, but we haven't created it. Um, we're not adjudicating within it. They're not our laws. And so if we want to correct that, correction has to come through a process of it inclusion because justice requires inclusion. Justice doesn't arise from a process of exclusion. And so when we're talking about inclusion, what are we talking about? We're talking about um, indigenous laws, indigenous traditions, um, indigenous ways of measuring what are the best interests of a child, both in family law and in um, child welfare law. So for example, under the Divorce Act, we have this principle of maximum contact with a parent. What if we took that principle of maximum contact with a parent and applied it as well to culture, maximum cultural contact? So then we start to make uh, decisions which favor greater contact. Um, as well, I think we have to look at different ways of making decisions. So right now we might have um, mediators, but are we actually looking within indigenous communities to ask what indigenous dispute resolution looks like and how we can empower those mechanisms because the decisions that might come from an Indigenous dispute resolution mechanism might look very different. They might value things different. So how we look at different um, involvement of Indigenous peoples in, in making those kind of decisions, I think is important as well. A transformed system for a family justice system for Indigenous children and families to me would look like one that would be rooted in tradition and ceremony uh, first and foremost, one that supports the whole family, including parents and parents, step parents, aunties and uncles, and is provide the support needed depending on the unique needs of all of those family members a prevention focus and one that is flexible, non-judgmental, and incorporates creative solutions, meeting families where they are at. The system should have plenty of navigators and support people that can meet with families individually and develop relationships to increase trust and understanding of the the systems and the processes, especially when there is overlap between systems um, or levels of court. If there are processes involved with Supreme Court and or Provincial and Territorial Court, 
then there needs to be navigators to increase the understanding and to help people to the expectations of the individual systems. And to me, that's what a uh, transformed system of justice for Indigenous families and children looks like. Uh, we have this idea of two-eyed seeing, that we make room for our own ways of taking care of our family, that we're on the land. We bring professionals out to understand this idea of connection and um, that we, we are responsible for our families and we will do what we need to do to take care of our families. Um, we don't wanna see them in the courts and we don't wanna see them in jail. We don't wanna see our children apprehended. And so if we have the prevention and health promotion according to our frameworks and our ways of understanding, then we can do that work with our families and we can um, gently pull them together um, and help them um, with healing, with unity, with a coming together to build trust um, and hopefully uh, change change how our families have been impacted for so long and um, so the governments the different levels of government can make room for that you know once when, when there's a family matter an urgent family matter you know all the family comes together and the fam and the father clan comes together and sometimes we're not allowed to do that because there's not enough space or um, the rules don't allow for that and so um, just to be mindful of, well, where is it not working and what can be done to make it better or make it different? Because um, we all have the ability, we all have the ability to adapt and change. And so to, to embrace that uh, transformation or change and um, with, this, with this clear vision or clear idea of how we want it to be, to be respectful relations, to be a place where everyone has a sense of belonging and uh, that we can walk together and live together and grow up together in a good way. So I think that's, that was, that's what I would say. My name is Jeremy Brooks and uh, I'm a member of the Okanagan First Nation in lovely Vernon, BC. And the name my grandfather gave us Klientalchen, which means frost the tops of the mountains. Uh, this time of year, you can see my name, you know, for good or bad. Um, I thank uh, everybody for having me back here. Um, it, it is my privilege to be here today, and I really do mean that. So when we talk about what a justice system or a family justice system particularly might look like if it were transformed and relational, it's an odd question. And it's an odd question for me because I really don't know if you could take the Lego pieces that are currently available and shift them in such a way where they'd look differently once it was done. The, they, I've spoken before about how the one of the problems with the family justice system for uh, Indigenous people, in my experience, and not just Indigenous people, but in culture of poverty, is that there's, there's a certain question of relevance. There's a certain question of necessity. Um, do you really need a piece of paper to be married? Do you really need a piece of paper to be a parent? Do you really need a piece of paper to tell you you're divorced? Do you really need a piece of paper for anything, really? And unfortunately, our, our justice system in general and throughout the branches um, seems to be very focused on process and perception and paper and all of those things that cause relationships delay. So, you know, I kept focusing on risk mitigation. The idea that one of the reasons for the processes uh, we have in place is because we're worried about liability. We're worried that it could bite us. And it's funny for me that in a system that is four children, four families, four parents, four people in need, four families, that the people that we as service providers are most concerned about harming are ourselves. 
And the risk that we're really most averse to is the risk to ourselves. And so I, I say this with all the love and affection that I can muster for you fine people. But until such time as we are more concerned with how our system impacts the lives of our most vulnerable, including those children who have a voice and aren't allowed to use it um, and have no vehicle to use it that wouldn't be heard even if they did, um, then I think we're hard pressed. So if I had to envision a, a transformed relationally based justice system, it would start with a principle of do no harm. It would start with a practical necessity of quickness and fairness. Um, and it would do so in such a way that recognized that there are multiple points of entry to people who seek to resolve disputes. And there are multiple equivalencies. And there are very good people who can do the job that the legal profession tries to do quickly, effectively, perhaps with less paper and definitely not charging $600 an hour to do it. So I love you dearly. I think it's great. Um, and I encourage this discussion to continue. Why slah, why linum? I think it's important to note that a transformed justice system will look different for every Indigenous community. There's not one type of transformation or one model um, that would be appropriate um, throughout. And that's because of the fact that law is rooted in culture and Indigenous communities um, have a diversity of cultures and languages and landscapes uh, and songs and customary practices and art that influence their laws. Um, that's become really apparent in the work that I've been able to do and privileged to do with my community, Couch and Tribes. Um, currently, right now, we're thinking about how to revitalize our own laws around children and families and how to ensure um, that the law that we're creating is grounded in our own our own culture, that it's grounded in our teachings, that it's grounded um, in our language. And especially um, in sort of these areas that um, have a very um, troubled past or history with our communities, we find that grounding it in culture, um, enabling um, or creating a law or legal framework that looks familiar to our community members, that speaks to our community members, um, that they can, that they find resonates within their own family teachings is so vital to the legitimacy of the work. Um, when we talk about law in this work that we're doing, we talk in my community about this concept of Snowyeth. Um, and Snowyeth um, is, you know, has a rough English translation of um, our way of being on Mother Earth. It's living a good life. Uh, and the teachings and legal principles that flow from our Snowyeth is really sort of this basis for giving, sharing, and supporting relatives in all of the Coast Salish world, throughout the Coast Salish world and beyond. And furthermore, it's also the foundation for reciprocity, both with kin and non-kin. And so really it's this uh, principle that's indispensable to um, how we understand our obligations to one another, how we relate to one another. And so we, drawing on these teachings, these teachings of kinship, respect, and reciprocity um, that are really at the heart of our Snow Wyatt, we can think about our obligations um, to family members and non-family members uh, and consider how we share and provide physical, emotional, and spiritual support. And so in the work that we're doing, we're trying to think about this within a child welfare or a child wellness context and thinking about what does it mean 
to um, recognize our relationships. Um, what does it mean um, to provide physical, emotional, and spiritual support within that model of relationships? Um, and we think that creating space for that or allowing those laws and legal principles to be stood up alongside um, common law um, or civil law traditions in Canada um, will bring about a transformation um, that's really vital if we think about um, how we want um, children and families, Indigenous children and families, um, to have a bright future.